Hi, this is Mike, and in my corner of TFB TV, I very much like doing videos by popular request. Now, in an earlier video, I talked about the specific things to look for when buying a Lee Enfield number no. four, which was the improved, sort of final, full size version of the Lee Enfield rifle introduced uh, during the Second World War. Now, uh, during this video, in the comments, a lot of people said, well, what about the SMLE, the earlier rifle that uh, was introduced before the First World War and served right through both World Wars and in fact is still in Indian police service up to this very day. Now, two problems with that. First of which was that at the time I didn't have an SMLE and also it's not quite as obvious and I'll tell you why. Now, with a number four, if you remember back to the earlier video and I'll put a link somewhere, you can test how good the stocking up is by pushing up on the, uh, on the barrel and seeing how much force it takes to lift it off the muzzle bearing. The SMLE is set up rather differently and it's rather more complicated. And I'll explain why. Now what they were trying to do with this particular rifle, uh, after the Boer War they decided that long rifle for infantry and a short carbine for cavalry wasn't the way forward, they wanted a universal short rifle for everybody. It had to be light enough, so the barrel had to be fairly light. And it's quite tricky, certainly with the knowledge of the, of the era, getting a light barrel to shoot straight was non-obvious. And the first one to really get it right was probably the 1903 Springfield. Um, now, not only did they want to get a light barrel to shoot straight, they also wanted that when you fix the bayonet, the point of impact didn't change. Normally when you fix a bayonet, and it's certainly the case on the, on, the, on the number four, it adds weight to the end of the barrel, it drags the shots low, and that was the case with the long leads. So what they came up with was this overly complicated kind of racehorse stocking up system that they've got in here, which succeeded in these two things. They, out the factory, they shoot well. Uh, the, the acceptance sand basically works out at four minutes of angle or better at the factory gate. Um, and with the original ammunition uh, during, during the era when it was designed, it was in fact the case that you fix the bayonet and the point of impact doesn't change. So, well, hey, and the first model of these, the uh, SMLE Mark I, uh, was introduced in about 1904. And then the uh, slightly improved one, the Mark III. And if you're wondering why there's a two, uh, this is just an accounting trick uh, because conversions from, from, from long leads and occasionally carbines, I believe, uh, were Mark II. So they improved it, basically improved the sights, improved the, uh, the charger guide. Um, 1907, still on 303 Mark VI, 215 grain, round nose ammunition, doing just under 2,000 feet per second. Uh, seemed to work well, bayonet goes on, no change in point of impact. This was introduced in 1907, and then in 1910, they changed the ammunition. Um, everyone kind of panicked when the Germans introduced a uh, pointy, pointed Spitzer bullet in 1905. Uh, actually, the first to do that were the French in 1898, but no one paid the slightest bit of attention to that. It was only when the Germans did it that everyone went, ah! And then the US upgraded their ammunition from the uh, 3003 to 3006. Note, I'm British, I say, oh, not ought. People say I ought to use different terminology, but I think I ought to uh, speak my own language, I think. Uh, you can permit me that. So the end result of this change in ammunition was that fixing the bayonet on an SMLE makes the point of impact go upwards and quite a lot. So it was all for naught. Ho hum. Right, so anyway, whereas with the number four, you've got contact at the, at the barrel reinforced and the receiver and the muzzle, which is similar to uh, all sorts of other rifles. Here, you've got a bit of a nightmare going on. Now I'm not going to take this apart today to show you how that works um, because basically when you're going into a shop to buy one the chances that the, 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 the shopkeeper unless you know them really well is going to let you take it apart and have a look is slim. So we're going to go from what we can see from the outside. So just like the earlier video I'm not going to go into obvious stuff like uh, checking the stocks type we're presuming that you know how to look down a barrel and see if it's straight, see if the rifling's crisp, uh, check that the, the, the bolt fits and what have you. Uh, the, magaz the magazine springs at least lively enough that the sights don't wobble too much. Um, a lot of minor things. You've got to remember that the vast majority of these were, were made 
during the First World War, at least the majority of the ones that are available on the market. So they're mostly 100 years old, plus or minus. Uh, you can shim things like sights, as long as they're not going you can you can fix that kind of thing. Now, unlike the number four, where, as I said, we can check the stocking up because it's only bearing there and there, it's tight at the muzzle on this. So, let's start at the front end and have a look through and see what we're supposed to see. What you're looking for at the muzzle is that the barrel is pushing against the top of the nose cap. Um, there might be some clearance up the top. Some of them, some of them have a little notch. Uh, this one doesn't really, um, but it should be pushing upwards. If it's centered, there's possibly something wrong. Um, usual, usual caveat of, uh, of if the person selling it says, oh, I fixed this, oh, I, I, I fixed the headspace, oh, I turned back the barrel, anything like that, I'd immediately reject that kind of thing, unless you've got actual evidence that it shoots straight. So repeated decent groups fired with it, not just three shots on a piece of paper saying, oh, this shoot's great, because it probably doesn't. Um, now what's going on here is that you've got uh, the nose cap squeezing the barrel onto um, a bearing surface there, and it's helped by a spring in here. And without the spring, it'll probably float centered. You don't, you don't want that. You want it to be set up as it as it should be. Another thing you can look at on the front here is to make sure that the front sight block does not touch the front sight protector. It shouldn't touch the nose cap. Um, again, this is something that, worst case scenario, you could, you could file it to give it some clearance, uh, but it's an indication of perhaps there's something not quite right going on here. If you can fiddle with screws a little, if you loosen this screw here, the, the nose cap should pivot under spring tension. Now the spring, if it's missing, there's a spring and there's a, um, there's a bearing plate, you can, you, can, you can replace that if you need to. But again, it's, it's a sign that something's not quite right. Now the other kind of unique feature on these is that there's an interior band. So you've not only got the nose cap and uh, the external mid band that the sling swivel goes on, but just behind the sling swivel, there's an extra screw. There's a band that goes around the barrel at this point, and uh, there's, a, there's a spring uh, between the head of the screw and the wood. If the spring's missing, it's probably not going to shoot right. I mean, they're, they're all individuals. They're all, they're, they're a bit like finickety racehorses sometimes, that uh, when they're working well, they're working really well. If something's going wrong, then you might have a problem. Uh, this one was splitting groups when I first fired it. And I discussed with someone who knows far more about these than I do. And he said, sort of wipe out the inside, wipe out the nose cap, and then play with the tension on this screw because some of them are highly sensitive to it. And it turns out that, yeah, this, this tightened right up when, I, when I'd uh, cinched this right down. Um, you might want to play with the tension on that. It'll affect the barrel harmonics. It's a very light whippy barrel. It floats from, uh, from here to here, and then it's got this complicated bearing system up here. So that's something to play with. If the spring is missing, order a new one. There's plenty of them around, they're not expensive. Um, and it just goes in here. Again, something to, something to check if you can fiddle with screws. Moving back to, to the rear sight, you don't want to have too much bearing. I mean, it's going to touch, probably. Um, but you don't want it applying lots and lots of force, the, uh, the upper handguard to the, uh, the sight base. Is, uh, that's going to affect how the barrel vibrates on firing. So you want to check that, uh, that it can slide there. The uh, rear handguard is clipped on with a spring clip. Not a lot you can do about that. But again, you want to just see that there's at least play. Again, it's something you can open up if you, if you need to, if it's a problem. But again, it's a sign that something's perhaps not quite right in the rifle. Moving back, um, in an in-range video, Ian um, had the bolt head on his 1918 SMLE jump the track. It was full of sand and everything, but it jumped the track. This is a point of wear. Now, on these, unlike the number four, the bolt head hooks over the rail underneath. On the number four, the rail's on the inside and it just uh, clips in on the inside. So it's worth 
checking the 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 rail on the bolt head aren't aren't particularly worn so all you need to get it in and out is at the rearmost position it'll just click in uh, there's a there's a little catch with a spring in it you can um, yeah replace the spring if that if that's a problem there but I like to move it along the rail and push up on it at every point just to make sure that that there's there's nothing worn significantly enough that it's gonna that it's gonna jump the track and uh, I quite like doing mad minutes with this kind of thing so I want to make sure that this isn't going to jump out on me and cause me a massive issue because you've got to get it back in um, I would reject a rifle where that came out unless I was skilled enough to repair it uh, you want to avoid you want to avoid replacing bolt heads because they've got to be uh, they, they've often got to be uh, stone to fit and I'm certainly not skilled enough with a whetstone to uh, to stone one absolutely perpendicular to the barrel. So that would be grounds for rejection for me. And with the bolt head, as long as uh, this part of the head doesn't turn totally past the lug, it's uh, normal and in good condition. And a final thing to look at from the outside is uh, you want to make sure there's no hard contact really between the uh, the fore end and the butt socket there. If you can get a piece of paper down there, it's good. If a bit of if it just hangs up a little bit, it's probably not too bad because uh, on recoil, the the metal goes that way and the wood goes that way. Not a problem. If it's got hard contact on one side, it's probably twisting the stock. It's probably a sign of, of some deeper problem going on in there. Um, as a hierarchy of uh, manufacture, effectively, anything in original, absolutely original condition, I'd take over a rebuild. This is a rebuild, but... I'm in Switzerland, uh, there are not that many of these around. Um, this one, interestingly, it's got some uh, some slight rust pitting underneath the bluing, and you can see from, from the markings that, uh, that this has been uh, uh, gone over. And what they've done, actually, is they've renumbered the receiver to the bolt rather than the other way around. So the receiver uh, serial number has been struck through and been matched to the bolt, which actually matches the end cap. So this was probably... Uh, at some point a battlefield pickup that was then uh, refurbished, rebuilt at a depot and what they would tend to do is they would match parts, they take two unserviceable rifles and make one serviceable rifle out of them and that's probably what's gone on here because the, the nose cap matches. All matching with no evidence of, um, of a rebuild I'd take as a, um, uh, as a preference over practically anything else. A bit uh, as in one made from parts, it might shoot straight, it might not. I probably want to see evidence that it shot straight, unless the price was right and I was willing to take a risk on it. Um, and yeah, that's about all you can uh, all you can tell from the outside. If the gunsmith or the shop will let you go in, what you can do is very carefully take it out the wood. And uh, to do that, you've got to get you've got to loosen a lot of screws. That one, that one, that one. Not that one, that one, and that one, and then carefully take the uh, uh, the trigger guard off, take the top wood off, and then very gently uh, take the rifle out of the wood, avoiding damage to the drawers in here. And the drawers are the sort of cam surfaces that, that help pull the stock in the right direction when you when you cinch it down. And then I take the fore end and look along it check it straight. If it's bent, I'd probably reject it out of hand because it's unlikely to shoot straight. If I was highly skilled um, and could steam it straight, then I might. Um, you'd also want to look for, for evidence that the barrel's been touching places it, it shouldn't, so any, any, any sideways contact. Um, it's probably not good. Um, and yeah, basically, uh, it's up to you, caveat emptor. I mean, uh, if the price is right, even if it's in rag order but works okay, why not? I mean, it depends what you want to do. If you want to shoot cans at 25 yards with it or if you actually want to do some serious target shooting with it, they're, they're two different issues entirely. So there you go. So I hope that was at least vaguely interesting. So uh, please like and subscribe to TFB TV's vid videos. Please consider supporting TFB TV on Patreon. And many, many thanks to our sponsors, Venturi Munitions, who helped to make this kind of content possible. Bye.